Okay, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Bernard, so much <clears throat> for inviting me. Thank you all for coming. So, indeed, as was as uh, um, as was just said, uh, what I'll be talking about is um, the dynamics of uh, interacting populations in uh, ecosystems. And so, if you have um, if you have organisms uh, that belong to different species. You know, we know that in nature they can live together um, and they have different population sizes. So an example could be uh, this uh, predator and this prey and they live together in the same habitat. And um, people have measured the sizes of the population of this hare, this rabbit, over time and of this uh, predator, this lynx, over time. And you can see that population sizes have fluctuated, have gone down, and then gone back up over time, over many years. And here's another example. This is an experiment that was done with uh, two microbes, and they put them together in the same medium. And in some cases, after some time, both of them managed to uh, coexist, to have populations that are you know, finite populations in, in, uh, and live together. In other cases, one of the populations went extinct and only one survived. And there are other examples. Here is an example in this beautiful area, uh, intertidal area in um, New Zealand. And there's four species, and they have some interactions between them. And this is the coverage uh, of algae of this rocky area here over time, over many years. And you can see that they, too, uh, fluctuate significantly. And this, uh, the authors here claim that this has to do with this interaction between these four species. OK, so um, a few species uh, dynamics uh, can be, um, um, you know, they can be either competition between species, as in this case here, between these two bacteria. They can be a predator prey, or they can be other things. Um, what can we say about them? Uh, people have modeled these uh, situations with dynamical equations, for example, ordinary differential equations. And uh, you can understand at least um, qualitatively and even in some cases quantitatively the behavior through these um, dynamical equations. Um, as you can see here, as I've been you know, hinting, these, uh, these interactions between the species can induce these very large fluctuations in population sizes. And so all this is for few species dynamics. This is classical uh, material in ecology. Um, the question I want to ask uh, and discuss today is what happens when there's not one, two, you know, four species? What happens when there's tens or even thousands of species uh, living together with uh, complex interactions uh, between them that can be different for each pair or, or, or a triplet of species? And OK, what happens there? So one thing is that. If you were hoping that things will calm down and you won't see too much fluctuations, uh, that's not the case. Um, you, there are situations where you see enormous fluctuations in population sizes when there are many species around. Um, and so what kind of questions uh, would we ask? In these cases, you would like to know, what are these fluctuations? So the most basic question, maybe these fluctuations that we're seeing, let's say here, in this, uh, in this uh, graph up there, are they maybe just due to changes in time in the conditions? Okay, the environment changes and so something is happening. Maybe it's just two or three species or four species that are doing some interaction between them uh, that causes these fluctuations and all the rest of the species are just feeling those interactions. Or maybe it's a truly a collective emergent effect um, that involves, really requires and involves very many species um, uh, interacting together. Okay, so that's the kind of question we want to ask. Um, now, I guess that for you know, uh, most of this crowd, if not all of it, I don't need to tell you this, uh, collective many variable phenomena exist in, you know, across many fields. You know, and, and, and we know these examples, material phases. I have water, which is a liquid in plus one degree Celsius, and then it's a solid in minus one degree Celsius. This is a very uh, dramatic and salient effect of um, the fact that there are many molecules in, 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 a, in a piece of, of ice. And then there's, if going closer to biology, flocks of birds obviously 
you know, it's not that the birds are independently there and they just happen to have to, to you know, form these, these uh, flocks. Obviously, they're interacting somehow. And then the question is, what, what would happen in ecology? What would be uh, something uh, of, this, uh, of this sort in ecology? And another point I'd like to make is that in addition to this interest that we have on co in collective phenomena, um, these questions, these fluctuations of population size, of course, are closely related to questions of coexistence, right? If all these species should need to or, uh, live together and the population sizes fluctuate this much, you know, some species could go extinct just because of that. Okay, so, so both in terms of, you know, the kind of questions we ask, the kind of um, um, theory we need to write, uh, and in terms of the practical uh, implications, this issue of coexistence and whether species can survive together is, uh, is very uh, central and important. All right, so today I want to focus, uh, especially following the, um, the lecture that was uh, given uh, earlier today, I want to focus on a specific um, example of a uh, transition, a dynamical phase transition, and this dynamical phase transition is actually one that is um, not unlike, at least in some, uh, in some aspects, uh, transitions that you see in other fields, such as uh, neural networks and game theory, economics uh, and, and cell biology and other places. Uh, and, and the idea is simple. You have some dynamical system and you have the parameters of the system. And as you change these parameters, there's a region of parameter space where the system in time, the variables reach some fixed point, they no longer change, and then after some point, they start to fluctuate. Okay, so that's, uh, and again, that was a scene that was discussed earlier today. And so the point is that this transition is a sharp one, okay? In, in a sense, it's a bit like this water to ice transition where there's you know, no dynamics up to here and then all of a sudden, uh, as you change system parameters, you start seeing dynamics. Okay. Um, and I, what I want to now tell you is a bit about how you, we model interactions and dynamics in interacting populations. And for that, what I want to focus on is what are the special uh, things, what is the set of properties that uh, we want to have, we want to capture when we uh, talk about uh, dynamics of interacting populations. So one thing we want to have, and, and this, uh, again, this is in common with other fields, is that the interactions are heterogeneous. So every pair of species, let's say, might have a different interaction. This pair might compete, you know, two, um, two plants might compete over water, and then uh, both of them, uh, there's this cow, and the cow eats both of them, and then there's something, you know, a bacteria that does something to the plants and something else to the cows, and so on and so forth. So there's this heterogeneity variability in, in, in what the interactions do. Another thing, which I, I've already alluded to, is this idea that there's this special um, value of the variables, which is population zero, okay? And when a, a, a population of some organism, some species, is zero, it remains there forever, okay? Unless, of course, it, you know, it comes from the outside and there's somewhere else in space and, and it can be fed in, uh, migrate inside, okay? So, so if you think in terms of dynamical systems, this is uh, an absorbing value for the value for this uh, for this population. Okay, and that will actually be very important and special in what follows. The last thing is that you have spatial structure or potentially have spatial structure. You already have a complex system if you have one well mixed uh, flask, you know, with with a bunch of uh, microbes inside. Okay, but you can have many different locations in, in space, each of them having the same type of complex interactions and with potentially with migration of individuals between these different places or seeds of trees that are planted and so on. Okay, so this is sort of like replicas of the rules of the game, but where the dynamics are popular, the, the state of the system in each one is different and they're coupled. Okay. So a crash course uh, in, in a few minutes on how we actually, we, you know, how people have been modeling for 
100 years at least, um, populations that interact in ecology. So uh, let's call Ni here the uh, population size of a species I. I runs from 1 to S. That's the standard notation in ecology. S is the number of species. And the simplest example is if you have just one population. So these are sheep that were introduced to Tasmania in the early 1800s. And you can see that initially the population grew exponentially. Uh, but then, of course, that couldn't last forever. And at later times, the population sort of stabilized. And so what's the simplest equation you could write for that? You say, well, I want exponential growth, but then I want it to saturate when I reach some uh, value. And a technical note, I'll be normalizing the population sizes so that when a uh, species is alone, it reaches one. Okay, it's just a normalization. Uh, so that's, okay, that's a logistic equation, you know, um, um, first year uh, type of thing. And then what, you, what would you do when you have two species? Well, for each of them, you'll, you'll put these, um, these logistic equations, and then you want some effect, some interaction between them. And so this, if this is this uh, limitation of the growth, let's add another term here, which is the effect of the other species. So we have a bilinear interaction, n1 times n2, with a prefactor here. Okay, And the same thing in the other. Uh, species, and already we have two additional new parameters, and if both of these parameters are positive, that could model competition. If one is positive and one is negative, that could model you know, predator-prey interactions, if both are negative mutualism, so it's quite rich already for two species. And then you can do this for any number of species, the same trick, you add one such term for each additional species that is interacting with species one, and you get the generalized lotka volterra equations, which are S-coupled nonlinear differential equations. Okay, so that's, that's one example of a model, a very common model that people look at. The, la the, the, the uh, one last um, thing we want to add into these equations is this idea that there is space. Okay, space is very important, and I'm going to, for today, do it in the most primitive way possible. Okay, there's space, things move around, but let's imagine that we're in only in one, we focus on one location in space, and we just imagine that all the rest of, of the, 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 the habitats around just contribute a migration. So seeds of trees enter from the outside, some unspecified um, space uh, around us, and that's just it. So I have the same equations as before, plus potentially if I like this additional migration term. Okay. So those are my equations. I'm sorry this was, uh, this was a bit uh, maybe technical and dry, uh, but we're done. These are the equations we want to look at. Um, and now we need to stop and think for a second because now comes what I uh, see as a fundamental problem or, or uh, issue. And that is that, okay, so we have these equations. Let's assume that these equations are indeed what describes the system, but um, if we have, okay, two species, then we have four uh, parameters here, which we don't know. Maybe we can fit them, imagine what they are, uh, measure. If we have 50 species, let's say, we're already up to over 2,000 parameters. And we're not going to know these parameters. We're not going to realistically measure with any accuracy even a fraction of all these parameters. Okay, so that is the, that is the real situation here. We do not know the rules of the game, okay? That's, that's, that's a serious problem here. And so um, one of the possible approaches, there are others, uh, which is, uh, you know, might be natural uh, to, to this crowd and, and, and people who've been following um, Bernard's, uh, Bernard uh, uh lectures, is to take these numbers here to be random numbers um, from some distribution, okay? And so you, uh, say, okay, I'm, I only assume that there's, the simplest uh, assumption is that these are independent, random independent numbers from some distribution, um, and I sample these numbers, and I fix them, and that's my, th that's my, um, those are the rules of the game, and then I let this thing run in time with, uh, with fixed numbers alpha, okay? And for simplicity in what follows, I'll show you simulations with these growth rates to be one, that is uh, less important to us. Okay. 
So those are the rules of the game. And now what do I want to tell you? One thing I want to describe is um, it, it, the, you know, the basic phenomena of, of this uh, transition to chaos and chaos in these systems, um, and even uh, show you some experimental results. And then I want to describe something that's actually special to uh, these equations that has to do with what happens when you take out migration. OK, so let's get started. OK, so you take the equations I just described to you, and then you run them on a, you put them in a computer, you start with some initial conditions, and you just see what happens. So sometimes what you see under certain conditions, you see the following thing. So this is the x-axis time, the y-axis is the population sizes, and each line here is one of the species. There's, I don't know, 100 species here, maybe something like that. And you see that, OK, um, they, some of them go down, some of them go up. They do a bunch of things. At the end, after some time they've reached a fixed point, the, these abundances, these population sizes no longer change. And you can see that there's a, this uh, clear division between those that have uh, population sizes, sizable population sizes, and those that have very small population sizes. And these are just those that are supported by the migration and actually don't grow independently. Okay, so these are present species and these are as good as extinct. Okay, they're not really found in the population. Okay, but then another, um, for other parameters values of, of, uh, of how you sample the alphas, you indeed get uh, fluctuations in population sizes that last forever and ever. So these are just three of very many species in the population, okay? And you see clearly, again, these very large fluctuations where species seem to go practically extinct and then come back up. Okay, so um, what can you uh, say about uh, this, um, these models on a more theoretical ground? So one thing that comes up when you do many, many calculations is that you keep seeing again and again and again the same three parameters, uh, which I uh, wrote up here. And basically, it's the mean and variance of the distribution of the alphas uh, combined with s, which is the number of species. And that's basically, so, so the first two moments, also, if you add correlation in the matrix, symmetry to the matrix, it also is important. OK, so these are basically the, th the three parameters. So instead of 2,000 parameters, you're left with three. That's, that's, a, uh, that's a big improvement. And so you can start drawing phase diagrams. And indeed, you see a, uh, an, as a function of the mean alpha I'm drawing here. And here is the variability, the heterogeneity in uh, this um, distribution alpha, how broad this distribution alpha is. You see a, f uh, a fixed point phase. And in fact, it's a unique fixed point phase. However you start your initial conditions, you'll reach the same fixed point and a chaotic phase. OK, and now what I want to do is show you, uh, describe a little more in detail um, the scenario of the transition to chaos in this system. So let's start down here at the bottom. So here, uh, the interactions between all species are identical. And then it turns out that you always reach a fixed point. Um, that's easy to understand. But then when you start increasing this variability, so some interactions are stronger, others are weaker, uh, what you see is a situation where you still reach a fixed point. However, some of the species go extinct. Okay? So first of all, when you start increasing variability, you start seeing extinctions. Okay? But you still reach a fixed point. Then at some point, you reach the phase transition. Beyond that transition, you no longer reach a fixed point. You see these fluctuations that last uh, arbitrarily long in time. As long as you wait, you still see these fluctuations. And in fact, these fluctuations can be shown to be chaotic. Okay. And finally, uh, as you continue to increase past this phase transition, the size of the dynamical fluctuations, which uh, I'll, I'll define slightly more precisely, uh, you take the time variability of each species, how much it fluctuates in time, let's say the variance in time, and you average over all species, um, that quantity, the strength of the fluctuation, increases continuously as you go uh, and, get, and go further into the chaotic phase. Okay, so in that sense, you know, it's what we would call a continuous phase transition uh, in, in those parameters. Okay, 
So this is, uh, this is the scenario. Um, this scenario, first of all, is not obvious. Okay, it could have been that the order of things would have been different. Um, a nice thing is that these are qualitative predictions. I don't, there's nothing quantitative here. And so uh, I could use this on other models, um, on experimental situations and so on. It turns out that even though this is, comes from some very complex, um, many variable nonlinear dynamics, it is common to many models, okay? That's just a fact. We've tried many models. Other people, well, the whole community has been trying to, you know, different models, for example, consumer resource models where the, 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 the water that plants, um, uh, you know, uh, take in is, is modeled explicitly. Resources are modeled explicitly, so it would seem like it's a very different situation. You still see more or less the same. A scenario, okay. So, so this is this is actually a, a very nice, um, a very nice uh, situation. And so, the next question is: Well, uh, can we uh, see any of this in any uh, experimental or even natural uh, situation? And so, what are the challenges in in actually testing this with uh, real organisms? So, the first thing is that. You, if you see fluctuations in population sizes, you can always suspect that it might be due to changes in the conditions in time, right? That's always a possibility. And so if, if you're out in the field, so uh, this really calls for a controlled experiment, okay? That's the first uh, piece of the, uh, uh, it's a very important and useful thing to do. And the other thing is notice that I kept talking about what happens when you change the strength of the interactions. Okay, but how do you control the strength of the interactions? How do you make a, you know, a, a lion eat the gazelles more? You know, that's it's not sort of maybe not so natural a uh, thing to think about. And so, um, an experimental uh, setting. Uh, this was done. It's work uh, that was done in uh, Jeff Gore's lab at MIT, um, and um, I was more on the side of the theory. Um, with uh, Mathieu Barbier also on theory, and then Daniel Amour and Ji Yang Hu that were uh, the experimentalists. What they did is uh, they, they know a lot about microbes and how to um, uh, grow and manipulate them. And what they did the following is the following thing. It's basically what these simulations that I showed you are doing. You take uh, you know, some set of microbes, okay? which they have in their freezers, and they take them out and they put them in together. And then you put them all in, and you grow them for 10 days. And every day, you add fresh medium, and you add a bit of all the species so that you do have migration. And then the remarkable and the special thing they can do is they can actually show that they can control the interaction strengths. And the way they do that is by changing the properties of the medium. And so you actually check the different uh, compositions of the medium have very significant effects on the interaction strengths. Okay, so we have this uh, thing that we can change, which is very much uh, what the theory is talking about. Okay, uh, in these, uh, in the what they can control is the number of species they put to in, and this, you know, roughly the interaction strength. It's the width of the interaction distribution, something like that. Uh, again, so these are, this is what the phase diagram looks like in these um, parameters they control. Again, all species coexisting, some of the coexisting still a fixed point, and then um, uh, fluctuations. And what they see, so they take uh, different combinations of 3, 6, 12, 24, 48 species uh, put together, and uh, different subsets of each. And what they see clearly here, what you see each line is one, uh, one run with a different subset. And okay, after there's some initial time when there's, sorry, the y-axis here is the total biomass. They measure it optically, okay? And so you, in, always initially there's some uh, relaxation time, but then if you have a few species at late times, you don't see much, too many fluctuations. Whereas when you go to more and more species, you see these cases where it continues to fluctuate significantly, uh, even at late times. Okay, so that's when you increase the species pool size, the number of species you mix. When you also increase interaction strength, 
you see that this effect happens both in this axis as before and also when you increase the interaction strengths. Okay, so that's one thing. And then what you can also do is you can sequence. You can actually see which species are in there in any day and you see that uh, and then you look at the last day and you see how many species are there of the original ones I put in and so this is the fraction of all species that you put in, how many are left. So at this area here, which is one, all species survive, then some of them and then fewer and fewer. And you can overlay that with the information about whether or not you saw uh, fluctuations at uh, the last uh, four days. And this is where you saw fluctuations in the fraction of the communities which fluctuated. And so uh, here, I'm just showing you an example. This is um, of uh, six species, well, there's like three, maybe four species that uh, manage to coexist here at the late days, seven to 10. And here is an example, and you see that there's more species, there's species um, that survive, but they also fluctuate dramatically over long times. Okay, and so this, these are the experimental results. These are the simulations that I uh, showed you before. Okay, now there is not, there isn't quantitative agreement between the simulations and the experimental data. There absolutely isn't. What there is, is um, agreement in the order of the phases and where they are, how they're organized in phase space, okay? That's the level uh, which we hope to expect and, and that's what uh, we are showing here. Okay, so, okay, so th this, is, this, is, uh, this is the experiment. Okay, I'm just happy to see this, okay? <laughs> yeah, um, seeing, uh, you know, I, I, who, who would dream, you know, water going to ice, seeing something like that in dynamics of actual microbes. To me, that's a nice thing. What we gain from that, uh, maybe I don't need to tell this crowd, is these are phenomena that were observed separately. You know, sometimes you don't see fluctuations in abundances of species. Sometimes you do, and here it is all in one place. And again, um, the models do not meet, do not agree quantitatively, but they do agree on a qualitative level. Okay, so that's, that's uh, the uh, basic story of fixed point and chaos. So we saw this phase diagram for the dynamics. We even saw, uh, we even saw it um, experimentally. Uh, as I mentioned, this uh, transition, what I told you so far about it, is in fact, um, you know, has a lot in common with um, a similar transition that's being seen in dynamical systems and other fields. And so, okay, maybe we can go home now. Um, and you're welcome to, if you like, but. Uh, there's actually one very important thing that I haven't uh, discussed yet, and that is that what I was hinting to, that actually the, when you are chaotic, you see enormous fluctuations in the population sizes, and by many, many, many orders of magnitude. And the question is, where does that come from? Okay, That is something which is special to populations, and that's something I want to discuss now. And more formally, the point is, that I'll make and, and try to explain is that chaos, as I've been describing so far, requires there to be this migration, okay, this additional term here. Formally, mathematically, taking this to zero is a singular limit for the dynamics, in a sense that I'll try to explain in what follows, okay? So this is what I want to describe now, okay. So um, let me go back to, uh, to a figure that I actually showed you. I showed you this figure before. This is just a population. This is just a, a, um, a situation where the dynamics of the system reach a fixed point. But I want you to actually look at the time scale here. So time scale, this is, these are natural units. So you know, order one would be a generation time in which you know, microbes will multiplicate, something like that. And so, the time to reach the fixed point here is actually extremely long. It's thousands of, or even you know, tens of thousands of generation times, okay? This is really, really long times. And this is the simplest possible thing. This is a system reaching a fixed point, you know? So the, it, 
people who play around with these uh, equations, with these systems, have noticed that this, these dynamics can be sluggish. That's, that's just a very rough name for this tendency of things to take way longer than you would have expected. And the question is, when, where is it coming from? And, and what you can notice is that when migration is low, and here migration is 10 to minus, I don't know, 18 in this simulation, that slows down things significantly. Okay, and so maybe the most striking, um, striking um, phenomenon that is associated with what this, this sluggishness, as I call it, is what happens when you actually completely take out migration. Okay, you throw it out completely. And so let's, let me show you now simulations without any migration. And so again, this is time and these are the abundances and there's many lines here, so I've just colored three of them. And what you can see is that at early times, the, these lines fluctuate a lot and fluctuate quickly. A lot is, is not the, the right word. It's just you see faster fluctuations and then you see that the dynamics slow down. Okay, it's just taking longer and longer and longer. And um, as, uh, as a standard, uh, what, what, the way to quantitatively measure uh, this uh, slowing down is to take two times and measure the autocorrelation of the population sizes, the vector of population sizes between these two times. And what you see is that the longer, the, the, the larger the initial time, the slower the decay of this uh, correlation function. And this dynamical slowdown is known as aging um, in, in the physical terminology. Okay. And then if you want to look uh, at why, why this might happen, what is this related to, if instead of looking at the uh, end here, you look at a uh, log axis of the same figure, what you see is that these um, variables which seem to disappear at zero, actually what they're doing is they're doing these dips to very low population sizes, which later uh, bloom back, which later uh, recover and come back. And the longer you wait, the, the deeper these dips are and the longer it takes for them to come back, okay? That's what you keep seeing here. Longer and longer dips that keep coming back. Okay, uh, this is what uh, we would uh, like to understand, ideally in Lotka Volterra, but I actually want to show you now in another model, another set of dynamics which is exactly solvable and where we can really understand the details of what's going on here. Okay, and um, before I do that, uh, I want to contrast this dynamical slowdown, this aging that I'm showing here, with one that is uh, well known, and again, uh, in, in the uh, lectures um, earlier today, uh, this was already mentioned. The, maybe the, the most famous example for aging is that in glasses, in glassy physics, and the usual scenario is that of a, you imagine a landscape, let's say an energy landscape, and the dynamics slow down as you're going down because you're losing some of the uh, unstable directions. There's more and more flat directions, and so um, it's harder and harder for you to go down quickly, okay? So um, that is uh, one scenario for this dynamical slowdown, and I'm already saying this now because what we'll be seeing is actually a very different scenario. All right. So there is one old and very well-known uh, model with just three variables, as if it's three species, which does show something similar to the, what we're seeing in our uh, system. And this is, is uh, sometimes called the rock, paper, scissors um, model. It's something, it's known from the 1970s. And what you have here is three species. Each one of them strongly inhibits the next one in the circle in this cycle, okay? So if species one is here, it's really not allowing species two to grow, okay? It's preventing species two from growing. Um, species two would prevent species three from growing, but species two now is not here. So what would happen is that species three can start growing. When species three grows, it, um, it kills species one, okay? 
And so we, we are left with a situation that now species three is the one that is abundant and species one and two are hardly there. And so what happens is that if you follow in the three-dimensional space uh, of, of these population sizes, you see that the dynamics go closer and closer to the three fixed points um, of, of this type. And of course, as you go closer and closer to fixed points, your dynamics, when it goes close to a fixed point, it slows down. And that causes this dynamical slowdown, this aging. And so this is, this is beautiful. This is a really nice thing. It's known, by the, by the way, in dynamical systems, this is known as a heteroclinic cycle. This is beautiful. Um, but again, it, the question is always, how relevant is it to a situation with not three, but 500 uh, variables? Okay, that's always the question. Um, and when you have many species, you don't have three fixed points all with the same properties. You have a range of fixed point properties. Uh, they might be more stable, less stable, and so on. Dynamics don't go in cycles. They you know, sometimes go in this direction, then in that direction, then in a third direction, and so on. Uh, and so we have, to, you know, we, we have to take what we can from this, but also uh, try to see what happens when many species are around. All right. So in order to describe this uh, new model that I want to tell you about, um, let me uh, first say that the lotka volterra equations, which I described before, are actually uh, an example in a broader set of models that are written as, are seen, as you've seen here, that the time derivative of each uh, variable, each population size ni, is ni times some function of all the other all, including uh, all the vector of all the populations. Okay, so that's a general thing. Um, so, yeah, single species uh, example is, is here when g is 1 minus n. The generalized Lotka Volterra is this linear form here for g, and so on. And these are uh, nice because the keep, they keep the n's non negative forever if they start non negative. Extinction, n equal to zero, remains so forever, which is this absorbing thing which is going to be, which is very important to us. Um, yeah, so it does everything we want. So uh, here's another uh, model from this class. This is a work with uh, Thibault, uh, who's, who's been working with us uh, in the last uh, year or so. And so we were looking for another model because the Lotka Voltaire was just not a good you know, too complicated place to start with. And so Thibault suggested the following model, um, where, I'm sorry, now uh, the just, it's a different paper, so it's different notations, and I'll be calling X now, okay? It's still population sizes, okay? It's just a different letter. So what you see here is that the different time derivative of X is this function of X times uh, the sum of all these X, other Xs alpha i j x j. Um, these dynamics, if they start, if all these x's start between 0 and 1, they keep x's between 0 and 1. The point here is, is as following, and we call it the mirrored extinction model, because just like in usual uh, situations where at 0 you stay at 0 forever, here when you're at 1 you also stay at 1 forever. So it's like there's two types of quote unquote extinctions. You either go extinct at 0 or at 1. And so, um, yeah, and so uh, both of these are absorbing values, and these alpha ij's are just independent random numbers, as before. And let's say with zero mean, it doesn't really matter. Okay, just uh, uh, what might be an ecological interpretation of this, this is not completely uh, insane. Uh, you could have a situation where a, a, uh, where a species, you know, it doesn't go above some uh, value, its population, because it's limited by something, by space, by some resource it needs and so on. And so it doesn't go below zero, it doesn't go above, let's call it one, but its dynamics in between might be affected by the other species, okay? So it's not completely insane. But really, uh, for us, honestly, what matters the most is that these dynamics are exactly solvable. I won't get um, into why and, and even what precisely that means. I do want to tell you what we get from this situation. Okay, so you run the dynamics. Um, and let's first look at what happens to one species within a large system. So I'm 
I have 500 variables, they're all running together, they're interacting as before, but I'm just looking at one of them. What I see the, is the following thing. Well, at initial times, at the, 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 the variable does something, but then uh, quite quickly it reaches either zero or one. It stays there close to one for uh, some time, and then it quickly switches to the zero, and then at later time quickly switches, and it basically does something that looks very close to a binary uh, uh, process that goes between zero and one. And obviously something interesting is happening close to zero and one here that we're not seeing. So let's stretch the, um, the segment from zero, between zero and one to plus minus infinity. That close to zero, it's like taking log scale. So we're basically taking a log scale at close to one and close to zero, if you like. And then what do you see with this new variable u, which is stretched from minus infinity to infinity? What you see is that u performs more or less a straight line, a ballistic motion for some time, then it changes its uh, direction and it performs a longer ballistic motion uh, in this direction, and then an ever lo longer one and longer one and longer one. Each time it performs an ever longer uh, ballistic motion. Um, and so, uh, here it is, these, this dashed line here in the, in, from the simulation. And so what this means is that with time, the xi, when you go and fold it back between 0 and 1, gets exponentially close to either 0 or 1. Okay? So you're really, really, really close to these two absorbing values, except during these rapid transitions uh, that happen in the middle. OK? Uh, right. So that goes hand in hand with a correlation time that grows linearly with the elapsed time. So these, these are these aging curves. The correlation time that you see, the correlation function that you see uh, decreases slowly, more and more slowly, uh, depending on the initial time. Um, and here is the collapse. Uh, with respect to this, uh, uh, the, the correlation time difference divided by the initial time. And by the way, the dashed line is uh, the analytical curve, so, so uh, the analytics uh, fit perfectly. Uh, what this means in, in, other, um, in other words, it's completely equivalent to saying that if I look, instead of looking at time, I look at log of time, I see a process which is a binary, it's almost a zero one process at long times, and which doesn't show any aging. Okay, here the differences in times, in waiting times, or, or in flipping times, um, don't increase with time. Okay, so that's, that's uh, what happens here. And maybe finally, the last um, point that I want to discuss is that of what kinds of fixed points do we reach? So, if you look at this uh, figure here, you're seeing that um, each variable is at long times, almost all the time, close to zero and one. So all the variables, except a fraction that becomes smaller and smaller in time, spend all their time close to zero and one. When you're close to zero and one, your dynamical equation means that your time derivative is close to zero. In other words, you're very, very close at long times to a fixed point. So what we can ask now is, what is this fixed point? Okay? What are its properties? Let's linearize the, uh, the system around this fixed point, as is usually done, uh, and look at the differences uh, from the, the, the fixed point. And uh, then you have, as usual, some matrix, J, I, J, not related to the interaction matrix. This is a Jacobian matrix or, or uh, some linear matrix. And first of all, if you do this for these dynamics where x is near 0, 1, uh, you find that this matrix, of linearized matrix of the dynamics is diagonal, okay? And on the diagonal, there are numbers. These are, no, let's call them gamma, okay? And what is the interpretation of these numbers? So, sorry, uh, here it should say gamma, and here it should say gamma, not lambda, on these two, uh, on this figure here. So when this gamma, is negative, that's situations where, where you're near the uh, one, you're being pushed towards one. When you're near zero, you're being pushed towards zero. So you're stable, 
Okay? You're close to a zero one and you're being pushed towards these directions. And gamma, which should, it should say here gamma positive, is a situation where you're close to, let's say, one, but you're being pushed away from the boundary. Close to zero, you're being pushed away from the boundary. In ecology, that would be uh, called a situation where a, a species can invade. Okay? It's at very low numbers, but it can start growing in. Okay? So these are invadable uh, directions uh, for, for the system. Okay. And the spectrum, the full spectrum at long times can be again calculated exactly. Uh, this is this um, orange smooth solid line here. Uh, below you can see a histogram of, from simulation and it matches uh, uh, beautifully. And so uh, what you see and the most important thing from this thing that I want you to notice is that here this dashed line, vertical dashed line is zero. Okay? So all the directions that are up here, these positive, again, lambda here should be gamma, I'm sorry for that. All these directions here are the unstable directions. Okay? So at long times, all the fixed points that are visited have this spectrum of, of eigenvalues, and they're all unstable. Okay? So the, there's a finite fraction, and it's not marginal. Uh, it's truly unstable. Uh, another point is that the, um, if you look at all the fixed points, you just take at random a 0 or 1 for each uh, variable, and you ask what kind of uh, spectrum would you get, it wouldn't look like this. It would be centered around 0, would be a different one. So you're not choosing the most common or typical fixed points. Nor are they the most stable in the spectrum. The spectrum has, in fact, marginally stable uh, um, spectra, and they're not reached either. Okay? So it's something that the dynamics chooses. And so let's, uh, let's close, uh, uh, take all these pieces and put them together. So I already discussed, you know, I want to make this contrast with uh, this, what I call here, landscape aging, like glasses. And in our model, first of all, there's no landscape, okay? There is, we're not performing gradient descent over anything. Um, again, this is something that has to do with the asymmetry of the interactions, something that Bill Nadrida uh, talked about earlier today. And so, you know, nothing to do with that. Um, the second point is that the spectrum, as I just mentioned, is always unstable, truly unstable. It's not close to marginality. Uh, however, what is happening here is that the variables go very, very close, extremely close to the fixed points, okay? Exponentially close to the fixed points as time, with time, as time grows. And what this means is that when a variable goes very close to a fixed point value, even if it changes its mind, its mind and it wants to now start growing away, because it's so close, it will take a long time to grow away, okay? And that is what, uh, slows down the process. It's this extreme, sick closeness to the fixed points that then uh, slows down when things change. Okay? And that's what causes the, the aging, and this aging is, uh, I think, I've, I hope I convince you, it's a different scenario uh, for what happens. Okay, so that is this uh, model, what we call the mirrored extinction model. Going back, I'll just add back um, uh, migration, and I want to explain uh, quickly what happens on the qualitative level. So let's go back to Lotka Volterra and let's add this migration term. What does migration do? It's an additional plus lambda at the end of the uh, thing, and basically what it does is it prevents, it's like a hard uh, floor, it prevents the va these variables n from going any lower than uh, some value lambda, you can see it here as well. Maybe it's a better uh, thing here. And so what would happen is that you would see this aging behavior that I discussed until a long enough time in which variables hit this floor and can no longer, um, can no longer uh, have these ever larger excursions. And that's when aging is, as they say, interrupted. And then what you get at later times is chaotic. But, and this is an important point, what you get is these huge fluctuations where uh, populations go from 
practically being zero, 10 to minus five, all the way up. Okay? This is known as species turnover. This is something you see, it's a common term in ecology, uh, that, that species disappear and come back. We see that uh, even in the experiments I showed you before, uh, we, you can see these things happening. Things going back, going down completely, and going up. So it's, there's uh, a change in the composition. It's not just fluctuations, it's a complete change in the composition. And, and that has to do with this increase of time scales, which allows for many generations uh, a population to grow or to decay. Okay, so um, I, I, every time I, I think of these things, I'm reminded of uh, newspaper clips where you see, uh, you know, a toad that was gone for 20 years is back. Uh, where has it been for 20 years? Uh, in, in, this, in this sense, this is quite natural that populations can look like they've disappeared completely for uh, a long time and then be back and happy, even without changes in, ex in external conditions. Okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to tell you. Uh, let me say quickly, we saw these dynamical phases, um, this transition from a fixed point to these fluctuations. Um, without migration, we see these fluctuations that keep growing. Eventually, by the way, true real populations are finite. So this will ev inevitably lead to extinctions if you don't have a uh, spatial structure. Um, when, with, when you have this migration, you have these um, chaotic fluctuations, but with these very large fluctuations in population sizes. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you.